Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Washington National Cathedral. My name is Randy Hollerith, and I'm the Dean of the Cathedral. And on behalf of all of us who serve this institution, we're so glad to have you with us. I bring special greetings from Mary Ann Buddy, the Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, as well. We are a house of prayer for all people, and we are glad that you are with us this evening, and I hope you will come back and see us often. Convening conversations, bringing people together to discuss and examine some of the most important issues of the day is one of our core priorities here at the Cathedral. Bringing people together, convening these conversations is key to our strategic plan for the coming years in this place. And since 2008, the Nancy and Paul Ignatius program has given this cathedral one of its opportunities to focus on many important issues, issues that sit, many of them, at the intersection of the faith and public life. The Nancy and Paul Ignatius program fund was established by Nan and Paul's children, David, Sarah, Amy and Adi, their friends and other relatives in recognition of Nan and Paul's service and commitment to this cathedral. While we said goodbye to Nan last year, this past year, and we miss her dearly, her legacy lives on in numerous ways and we are blessed to have Paul as one of the mainstays of our cathedral community. We are deeply grateful to the Ignatius family for their support and for their great work. And I hope you will join me in thanking uh, the Ignatius family for making this evening possible. Our topic for tonight is a relevant and timely one, uh, cyber issues, cyber warfare, is critical issue for this nation. And we have much to learn about not only the opportunities of being globally connected in this new space, but the dangers and challenges as well. So many thanks to our speakers and our panelists for sharing their time and their expertise with us tonight. Now, if you know the Ignatius family, then you know that all four of Paul and Nan's children are incredibly talented and accomplished. And in just a minute, I'm going to turn the mic over to two of them, to David and Adi. But before I do, please allow me to tell you just a little bit about them. David Ignatius is an accomplished journalist and a novelist. He's an associate editor and columnist for the Washington Post. He has written 10 novels including Body of Lies, which director Ridley Scott adapted for film. He's a former adjunct lecturer at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and currently senior fellow uh, to the Future of Dipl Diplomacy program. Adi Ignatius is editor-in-chief of Harvard Business Review. Prior to joining Harvard Business Review in 2009, Adi held several positions with Time Magazine beginning in 1996. Most recently, he served as deputy managing editor responsible for many of the publication's special editions. Before time, Adi worked for many years at the Wall Street Journal. Please join me in welcoming David and Adi Ignatius. So our thanks to, uh, to Dean Howarth. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, on behalf of all the members of my family, including my dad, who's sitting in the third row, uh, who uh, were especially happy to be able to uh, present this program for. Uh, we chose a slow news day for tonight's uh, event. There's not much going on in Washington. Uh, I'm afraid uh, chaotic days are becoming the norm. So uh, Dean Hollerth mentioned uh, our mother, uh, Nancy. Uh, she was passionate about many things, but I think um, more passionate about arms control than any other subject through the uh, Cathedral's Peace Commission and, and in many other ways. So this uh, subject tonight, which is really, in a sense, the, the, the frontier of arms control, 
would be uh, one that, that she would uh, care deeply about. Let me take one minute to set the stage before turning this over to, to my brother Adi. Um, we are today in, in a constant low-level state of cyber war. That's not me as a journalist talking. That is General Nakasone, the commander of cyber uh, Cyber Command and the director of the National Security Agency, who has written uh, that our adversaries are conducting continuous cyber assaults against the United States, and that the United States should respond with what he calls forward defense and a strategy of persistent engagement, which means basically, uh, you know, a, a two or three on a on a scale of one to ten uh, all the time. That means that cyberspace, which is the space where we all conduct uh, our, our business, uh, our political, our personal lives, is now a domain of war. Unlike other domains of war, this one doesn't have effective rules. There is no Geneva Convention, uh, despite efforts of, of one of our speakers, Brad Smith, uh, for, for cyberspace. Cyberspace is different. Uh, we civilians who are protected uh, by the Geneva Convention and other domains of war uh, are uh, the terrain, in effect, on which this, this cyber conflict uh, is, is fought. So our question tonight in all the parts of, of our program is how can we apply limits in, in this space? Um, we're going to try to think uh, creatively about a puzzle that the military and national security planners uh, worry about uh, every day. So I want to turn the platform over now to my, to my brother Adi, who's going to summarize uh, the, the flow of events tonight and introduce our speakers. Thank you, David. I just want to add a little bit to what David said. Um, this series of lectures is very dear to our family. Um, as the dean said, the Ignatius program was launched in 2008 named, of course, to honor our parents, Nancy and Paul Ignatius. Um, as Dean Hollerworth noted, our mom passed away earlier this year, but it is truly thrilling to see Paul, our father, sitting in the third row, uh, being here as he always is, taking this all in, and it's just an honor to be here in front of you. Um, our parents have long been great supporters and lovers of the cathedral and its mission. And we, the Ignatius family, are proud to play a role in hosting this, a yearly event that we hope contributes to constructive dialogue on some of the most important and challenging issues the world faces. Previous Ignatius forums have covered, among other things, America's role in a dramatically changing world, ideas on how to bridge the nation's political divide. That, that one didn't really work. Uh, the rise of China capitalism, morality, and inequality, and the 21st century global nuclear threat. This year, the themes are cybersecurity and cyber warfare. Topics, as, as we'll hear tonight, are not a distant futuristic risk, but represent a very present danger for governments, for businesses, for us all. So let me just quickly uh, sketch out the program for tonight. In just a moment, I will introduce our keynote speaker, former National Security Advisor Susan Rice, after her remarks, I'll come back to lead a discussion with Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, and then David will return to lead a panel discussion on the laws of war in cyberspace, featuring General Keith Alexander, former head of the National Security Agency, Joseph Nye, a political science, scientist at Harvard University, and Laura Rosenberger at the German uh, Marshall Fund. So there's a lot to get through tonight, so uh, without further ado, let's get started. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Susan Rice. Susan served as National Security Advisor for President Obama from 2013 to 2017, and before that served as uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Susan was born in Washington, D.C., and is very much a member of the Cathedral family, having studied at National Cathedral School before going on to Stanford University and after that winning a Rhodes Scholarship. She is currently a Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow at American University's School of International Service. Susan has just written a, a memoir focusing primarily on her years in public service. The book is called Tough Love, My Story of the Things Worth Fighting For, and it will be coming out in just a couple of weeks. 
Cybersecurity was a big part of her brief as National Security Advisor. She once said, it is a threat to our economic security, it is a threat to our national security, and it is a threat that may emanate from states or non-state actors or teenagers in their bedrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, Susan Rice. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight in this magnificent cathedral. As Adi said, I've had the immense pleasure of spending my, many of my years here on the Cathedral Close as a student at both the Beauvoir and National Cathedral schools, as a worshiper, and as a proud Washingtonian. Still, this extraordinary nave with its outstanding stained glass windows never ceases to awe and inspire me. Thank you, Dean Hollerith, and your dedicated team for hosting us today. Thank you, Adi and David, and the entire Ignatius family. It's good to be home. Let me also warmly welcome everyone who came to join this important conversation on cybersecurity. We're glad to have you here. And I especially want to thank our expert speakers, each of whom was once or is still a valued colleague of mine. Brad Smith, General Keith Alexander, Joe Nye, and Laura Rosenberger. I've always been proud to work with each of you. We all look forward to learning from you this evening. And again, I want to thank you, David Adi, and your family for convening such a critical forum, not just this year, but for 10 years running on matters vital to our nation and the world. The strength of this program is a wonderful testament to the incomparable Paul and Nancy Ignatius. I'm honored to be a small part of your legacy by giving tonight's opening remarks. Among the landscape of serious and growing threats to our national and global security, from climate change to terrorism, from revived great power competition to pandemic disease, perhaps no threat has evolved more swiftly and substantially than cybercrime and cyber warfare. For all of the incredible advances in communication, education, and development that we owe to this digital age, the increasing significance of data and the internet in our government, economy, and everyday lives creates new and dangerous vulnerabilities. It was once the case that only major governments or powerful non-state actors were capable of launching a disruptive and damaging attack. Today, that attack can emanate from a small team of hackers working for a foreign adversary, an army of bots programmed to flood our social media feeds, or the actions of a single person able to access and steal information. Moreover, the explosion of Internet of Things devices is exponentially increasing the risks we face. The implications for our national security are evident, and the challenge of keeping up with and getting ahead of cyber threats is daunting. Yet in order to keep our country and its citizens safe, this is a challenge we absolutely must meet. Throughout the Obama administration, cybersecurity remained a top priority. We understood that such a multifaceted problem had to be treated with urgency, coordination, and innovation. President Obama made the first ever mention of cyber in a State of the Union address and followed it up with concrete action to close the gap on this major national security challenge. We established a permanent U.S. Cyber Command and Cyber Mission Forces, led by General Alexander, and authorized a record $19 billion in cyber budget under our 2016 Cybersecurity National Action Plan. We worked with Congress to pass bipartisan Cybersecurity Act of 2015, improving our information sharing mechanisms while protecting privacy. And we issued Executive Order 13694, the first ever sanctions regime for use against malicious cyber adversaries. 
Despite the wide range of threats we faced over eight years, our early and constant emphasis on cybersecurity was fully warranted. As Adi generously said, in two weeks, my memoir, Tough Love, My Story of the Things Worth Fighting For, will be published. In many respects, it's a very personal and family story. But I also recount several cyber-related challenges, starting with one of the most harrowing that unfolded during my first month as National Security Advisor. If a coup in Egypt on day one weren't enough, the full weight of the Snowden leaks hit us promptly thereafter, as Keith and Laura will recall all too well. The Snowden leaks underscore the unique challenge of defensive cybersecurity. The wrong information in the wrong hands can precipitate a crisis of nearly overwhelming proportions. Yet President Obama recognized the imperative of balancing effectively the need to monitor cyberspace and deter terrorists and other attacks with protecting the privacy of our citizens. And that's why he directed sweeping reforms to our policies and practices involving signals intelligence, codified in Presidential Decision Directive 28. Still, the fallout from that insider attack endures to this day. The major external cyber threats we faced revealed the scope of the challenge. Confronting foreign adversaries like North Korea, Iran, Russia, China, and ISIS, preserving our economic competitiveness, and protecting the integrity of our elections. When North Korea hacked Sony Pictures in 2014, we called them out, imposed additional sanctions, and strengthened public private sector coordination while continuing to pursue a wide range of means to set back their nuclear and missile programs. Iran, too, utilizes cyber operations against the United States and our regional partners. Then, as now, we took necessary measures to counter their nefarious behavior and punish, him, and punish them for violating their international obligations. As ISIS utilized the World Wide Web to propagandize, recruit, and finance its operations, again, the United States took concrete steps, including in cyberspace, to degrade and ultimately defeat their so-called caliphate. And importantly, we worked with the private sector to counter their abuse of social media platforms. ISIS's abuse, not the private sector's abuse. And that was a harbinger of the kind of partnership that's needed even more today against the torrent of hate and disinformation. On both offense and defense, cyber action is and must remain a critical front in countering foreign threats. Take China, which for years has engaged in cyber theft of intellectual property from American companies to advantage Chinese companies at our expense in what Keith Alexander has presciently called the greatest transfer of wealth in history. This behavior was blatant and relentless despite sustained U.S. opposition. The Obama Justice Department indicted five members of the Chinese PLA for cyber-enabled economic espionage against American companies. And finally, in 2015, facing the threat of serious U.S. sanctions on the eve of President Xi Jinping's first state visit, the Obama administration achieved an important, if unlikely, agreement with China that barred commercial cyber theft. Further, we worked successfully with China to promulgate similar international cyber norms at the UN, APEC, and the G20. This important agreement was largely respected well into the Trump administration when intensified friction in the US-China relationship led China to resume cyber theft for commercial gain. Nonetheless, the 2015 agreement underscored the important role that bilateral and multilateral diplomacy can play in establishing norms and potentially new laws of cyberspace. 
We need those norms and that diplomacy to address the far-reaching impacts of NotPetya and WannaCry, as well as a ransomware that has wreaked havoc in cities here at home. However, the most pernicious cyber threat we face continues to loom large. Russian interference in the 2016 election was the most stark manifestation of its ongoing attack on America's national unity. Russia's theft and dissemination of emails, efforts to penetrate our state's electoral systems, its social media campaigns to sow disinformation and exacerbate our domestic divisions, combined to pit Americans against one another and raise doubts about the integrity of our democracy. Although we impose substantial costs on Russia following the 2016 election, they are not enough. Pressure on Russia still needs to be increased and then sustained. Russia's ongoing attack on our democracy constitutes the most direct assault against America by a foreign government since World War II, and it must be treated as such. Despite the U.S. intelligence community affirming that this threat has persisted from 2016 through 2018 to this day, little is preventing Russia from interfering again with more sophisticated means in the upcoming 2020 elections. It's past time that the administration and Congress unite in a bipartisan fashion to appropriate the necessary funds and mandate the policy changes that would make a meaningful difference in, in the cyber defense of our democratic system. In this moment of profound political polarization, how do we reliably and effectively address a threat as pervasive as cybersecurity? We must demand that our political leaders cease downplaying or weaponizing this issue for partisan gain and hold them accountable. It's in the interest of every American that cybersecurity remains a top priority, no matter who is the attacker or who is in the White House or who is leading Congress. I'm glad to see the Trump administration advance and uh, improve on some of the important cyber initiatives of the Obama era, including many provisions of the Cybersecurity National Action Plan and the NIST Cybersecurity Framework Standards for protecting critical infrastructure. But mixed messages from the White House and stubborn intransigence by key leaders in Congress have slowed necessary progress. Cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. Government, the private sector, nonprofits, and individual citizens each have a role to play in strengthening our national defenses. Let's marshal the unmatched collective capacity of American industry and entrepreneurship, universities and government-sponsored research and development to lead the world in cybersecurity and to advance our interests in cyberspace. Fundamentally, I remain an optimist, and thus I'm confident that with visionary leadership, America can and will rise to meet this urgent challenge as we have so many others over the course of our lifetimes. Thank you. So I, I want to thank uh, Susan Rice for a really inspiring talk and uh, for reminding us that there is an optimistic view uh, on what's happening and really the need for collective action uh, globally between government and, and private enterprise. I think we're going to get into some of those themes now. So I am here with Brad Smith, who is the president of Microsoft. He's also uh, its chief legal counsel. And in those roles, he spearheads the company's work in handling some of the most critical issues of our time, sustainability, privacy, artificial intelligence, 
many others, and then most pertinent for tonight, uh, cybersecurity. Brad recently published a book called Tools and Weapons, The Promise and the Peril of the Digital Age with co-author Carol Ann Brown, who is here as well, uh, who is Microsoft Senior Director of Communications and External Relations. So there is a lot to talk about. There are a lot of issues to cover, but w why don't we start with the book? Um, it's, called, it's called Tools and Weapons. Why is it called that? And, and more broadly, what do, you, you know, what do you hope to accomplish with this book? Uh, well, first of all, thanks uh, for the opportunity to be here to certainly follow in Susan uh, Rice's footsteps and uh, address these issues. It's called Tools and Weapons for a simple reason. Digital technology has not only become ubiquitously important to every part of our lives, but it has become both a tool and a weapon. Uh, when you think about it, you know, even a broom can be used to sweep the floor or hit somebody over the head. Any tool can be used for ill. Clearly, the more powerful the tool, the more formidable the weapon. And it is impacting our lives in increasingly challenging ways. It is being weaponized. It's posing challenges for privacy, for the economy, for our jobs. And we wrote the book in part to level the playing field to make the information about what's happening more accessible and to thereby promote a broader conversation about what we should do to address the threats that are being created. Okay. So, so, uh, so Susan mentioned the WannaCry episode of 2017, and you write about that in the book. And in some ways, that seems to be a great example to sort of talk about, you know, the new perils and the kind of imperative for companies like Microsoft to respond to them. Can you talk a little bit about, about your perspective from the inside on that? I think in the history of warfare, the 12th of May, in 2017 really stands out as in some ways a unique moment in time. Because as it's now been established and agreed by multiple governments, the North Korean government unleashed a cyber attack called WannaCry. Initially it went to the United Kingdom, to Spain. In the course of less than 24 hours, it disabled 300,000 computers in 155 countries. So just think about that. A nation launching an attack that reaches 155 countries in one day. And while it's easy, I think, for people to say, well, you know, look, it was just a computer attacking computers, there were real lives at stake. As we share in the book, the story of one person, a fellow named Patrick Ward, he was in London about to go into heart surgery when the hospital that he was in a hospital that literally had never closed throughout Hitler's bombings in World War II was brought to its knees by this attack. In fact, a third of the hospitals in the United Kingdom had to stop their work in every way because they were reliant on these computers for everything they did and the computers froze. Okay, so, so, so keep going then. So, so this happens, unprecedented maybe, or, or one of the biggest attacks of its kind. So what happens then? What, what, what can and do governments do? What can and do a company like Microsoft, which is more involved than you would have wanted to be, what do you do at that stage? Well, I think it, it, it really first calls on us to reflect a little bit about the nature of cyberspace. When you think about the history of conflict, probably started on land, moved to the sea after millennia, moved into the air, people have thought about it in outer space. Now we're talking about it in cyberspace. Cyberspace, I think, in a very important respect, is different from the other four. Why? Because it's privately oftentimes owned and operated. When we're talking about an attack on cyberspace, it's often on data that's in data centers that are operated by tech companies. It's on fiber optic cables that are operated by telecommunications companies. Actually, it's an attack on you. Because if you came here and you have a phone in your pocket or your purse, you are part of cyberspace as well. So by definition, we in the private sector have a very different role to play when it comes to protecting cyberspace. And when we think about what is protected, in part it's what we need to do is detect these attacks and attribute them so that people are held accountable. And then we need to, at times, take our own steps, but more importantly, work with governments and others so that there is defense, so there is deterrence, 
And ultimately, we would argue, so there are clear rules that establish what is lawful and what needs to be out of bounds. So this 2017 attack did go away. I mean, the, the, the keys were found to turn it off, basically. Um, but I want to ask, you know, what, what is your biggest nightmare, this sort of credible next wave attack? What is your biggest nightmare? And I'll also ask, what could possibly be done to avert that? Well, we, I think, unfortunately, run so many risks in the world today. And at one level, we sort of run a low-grade fever uh, with this constant environment of living in a world that is not quite at war, but not really at peace. Uh, and you know, we see these uh, constant attacks, some by criminal organizations, sometimes by nation states, often by almost a hybrid effort where certain nations are outsourcing their attacks to criminal organizations. That's constant. And we also run the risk of attacks that are much more substantial. At times, we've seen them against oil refineries. You can disable an oil refinery with a drone or a missile you can disable an oil refinery with a cyber attack. Uh, you can see the threats on the electrical grid. But if you ask me what I worry about the most, it's the threats to our democracy. You know, threats that we've seen grow because in some ways we actually see so many of these threats so clearly. We get at Microsoft more than six trillion signals a day back to our data centers from devices around the world. And so you see it in the weaponization of email, you see it in the disinformation campaigns. I think most alarmingly, you see it in the potential attacks on the integrity of our voting systems. And those, I think, could be calamitous to our democracy if we don't do more to protect against it. So you, you ask in your book whether we can adequately prepare ourselves for a digital 9-11 before it happens. Is that what you mean by digital 9-11, or are you thinking of something that is more, um, you know, that brings down business, that brings down government? Well, unfortunately, a digital 9-11 could take multiple forms, but I'll give you two that I think we should worry about especially. One would be if we woke up in November of 2020, a week after, say, someone was elected president, winning in three states by a small number of votes, and then finding out that votes had been counted but had never been cast. That would be calamitous. That would be a digital 9-11. But if you also want to consider a digital 9-11, just consider the 27th of June in 2017 if you lived in Ukraine. Russia launched an attack called NotPetya. Ambassador Rice referred to it. It not only disabled 10% of all the computers in Ukraine, it meant that people couldn't go to an automated teller machine to withdraw money because the ATM stopped working. They couldn't use their credit card at the grocery store because the computers at the grocery store stopped working. Life in many ways halted. Businesses had to close because their data was literally destroyed. So these kinds of problems can take many forms and we've seen glimpses of just how serious they can become. So we've run articles in Harvard Business Review saying that you know, we cannot ever fully protect against a cyber attack so that we all need to think instead about what we digitize, you know, what we're exposing, basically, and that we even need to preserve analog capabilities that we thought were on their way out. Does that make sense to you as a guy at Microsoft? Yeah, I have found myself in the unusual position of talking to people in governments who tell me that they have paper ballots, and I say, that's a good thing. Don't throw them away. Um, we love digital technology. We think there's future approaches to securing ballots and elections. Um, but you know, it, it, there, you know, there are certain view, virtues in analog technology. Um, David mentioned in his uh, intro that um, one of your pet causes has been to try to convene an effective digital Geneva Convention. And I guess the idea is that would establish rules of the road for uh, all you know, participating parties. Uh, and I think the idea is rules like tech companies will never help governments carry out cyber attacks on innocents and the like. But it, it seems like such a good idea. Could you talk a little bit about the model, obviously the Geneva Convention model, and wh where are we in this process? Well, the, the, the first and in some ways most important point we're trying to remember is let's hold on to some of the most important advances of the 20th century. 
1949, in the wake of World War II, the International Committee for the Red Cross brought together the world's governments to adopt the Fourth Geneva Convention. And when you think about arms control, there'll be people talking a lot more about it. You can ban weapons, you can limit their number or nature, or you can control and regulate how they're used. And fundamentally, what the Fourth Geneva Convention did is say that the governments of the world have not only a moral responsibility, but a legal obligation to try to protect civilians even in times of war. Now it's the 21st century. T civilians need to be protected from these attacks in what mostly is a time of peace. And we need to build on the rules that exist already, the United Nations Charter, the Fourth Geneva Convention, the norms that have been created, including by the Obama administration that Ambassador Rice mentioned. We need to fill in the gaps. We need to make it clear that it is not acceptable under international law to use disinformation to interfere in a foreign election or to tamper with voting or to hack and weaponize email. And we are making progress, but we have a long ways to go. Most importantly, in Paris last November, on the centennial of the armistice that ended the war that was supposed to end all wars, Governments came together to adopt what's called the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace. It now has 67 gun governments, 140 NGOs, 350 companies around the world signing up and calling for more action to put these rules in place. Okay, so let's talk about the Paris Call for Trust. So that is a great start. I guess my question is how effective can an or in a, a, a declaration or, a, or a, a coalition like this be without key players like the U.S. government involved? Well, and you just hit the nail on the head. It was unfortunate in our view that we've had 67 of the world's democracies come together, but not arguably its most important, the United States. There's 27 of 29 NATO allies, all 28 members of the EU, four of the five allies, but not the United States. Uh, now, I believe every day we have to focus on building a coalition of the willing. The United States has not signed the Paris call yet. The United States government hasn't supported other key multilateral initiatives yet. And I believe that if we continue to generate momentum, and especially if we continue to build more global support from the 76 nations that are this world's democracies, we can continue to move forward and the day will come when our own government joins as well. One of the challenges it seems that with, with responding to cyber attacks is the inability to know necessarily what the source of, you know, where they came from. And, and that can be true with missile attacks as we've seen recently as well, but um, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, even the, I don't know, the, the, you know, the, the Sony hack that's generally attributed to North Korea, WannaCry is generally attributed to North Korea. Uh, you know, it, it sort of matters who did it in terms of what the response is and how you head off the next one. How good are we getting, let's say, from your perspective, at correctly identifying who is launching these effective attacks? We're getting better and better. I think it is becoming increasingly difficult for governments to launch these attacks and hide in the shadows. One reason we're getting better and better is that the you know, governments in the world's democracies, the five eyes, are getting more sophisticated, they're sharing more information. But interestingly, we're also getting better because the major tech companies are far more sophisticated as well. We have what I think is probably one of the world's most sophisticated threat intelligence centers at Microsoft. In the wake of WannaCry, which I believe one can accurately state is not just something that should generally be attributed to North Korea, but should be specifically attributed to the same group in North Korea that attacked Sony. We got together as a company with other companies. We shared our information. We concluded quite without any doubt in our minds where the attack came from. We shared that information with the United States government, with others of the Five Eyes. Ultimately, the US and six other allied nations publicly attributed that attack to North Korea. It was the first time that we've seen that kind of multilateral diplomatic attribution. That is one of the steps, of the many steps, that's needed to help discourage, to deter this kind of activity. 
I, I know that the digital Geneva Convention you're talking about would, would sort of lay out the ground rules, among other things, for how private business cooperates with government. Um, but I'm interested, uh, until then, what are the rules and what are the limits? I mean, if, you know, if, if Huawei said, well, we're going to work with the Chinese government, a lot of people here would think that's pretty scary. You're, I think, rightly talking about how companies like Microsoft will cooperate with the U.S. government at times. W what's okay, what's not okay? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, there are important rules and norms that exist already from the other four spheres of potential conflict. But they were not surprisingly designed to apply to acts of war. The International Committee for the Red Cross has legal authority and the governments of the world have legal responsibility when there is a war. The United Nations Charter prohibits acts of war. So the first question is, are these attacks that are taking place acts of war? There's a good argument that they are, but only if the world's governments stand up and say, yes, they are, we're going to treat them as such. I think there are probably some gaps that we're going to need to fill in. And I think especially when you're talking about these disinformation campaigns and the like, I think we need to either have the governments of the world state clearly that they're prohibited under the rules that exist already or add to them because either way, they shouldn't be allowed. Let me, let me ask you a little bit more about China. Um, it seems that in many ways China is pursuing a, a, a kind of a different, a parallel track in technological development that is in some ways different from the West with, you know, in some ways its own internet and, and with divergent other technological standards. I, how does that, d does that help or hurt? I mean, that would seem it might complicate everything that we're talking about. Um, do you see it that way? Is that an issue? Well, I think that there's no technology relationship in the world today that is more complicated than the relationship between the United States and China. We devote a chapter to it in our book. Um, I do think that Ambassador Rice was correct when she said that the uh, agreement that was negotiated between the Obama administration and the Chinese government announced in September of 2015 had a real and positive impact. But it is a very complicated world. And what I would say in part is, in so many ways, the economy of the world for the next three decades will be shaped profoundly by developments in artificial intelligence. And there is, if you will, a bit of a race between the world's two AI superpowers, the US and China. And more so than almost any other technological race of the last three centuries, the U.S. in some ways is at an inherent comparative disadvantage, at least in one important way. AI advances based on large amounts of data. The more data you have, the better you can be in training artificial intelligence systems. The amount of data that any country has is principally a reflection of two things, the size of its population and the size of its economy. We are a nation of 320 million competing with a country of 1.4 billion. When you think in those terms, I would argue that it, in fact it reinforces everything else we're talking about here. If the U.S. is going to be competitive in a future race around artificial intelligence, we need to build an alliance among the world's democracies with the 520 million people in the European Union, with Canada, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, now you have a population of 1.1 billion. Now you have data and norms and principles that can enable us to win the next race that is going to shape the economy of the world. All right, so, so I think I've got time for one more question. And a lot of our conversation has been at a very high level, very sort of geopolitical. And you know, I wonder, do you have advice for the people who are here, for me, you know, how do, we, how do we think about this threat? What do we do to uh, whatever, keep ourselves safe or, or make sure smart people are doing the right things at this moment? I would leave everyone with two thoughts, one very pragmatic and one much broader. On a pragmatic basis, there's two very simple things that everyone in this room, everyone anywhere in any room can do to protect themselves. One is use what's called two-factor authentication on all of your services. That means you have to use a password and turn it on, so you also have to enter a code, for example, that's sent to your cell phone. 
If you do that, you are far more likely to be protected against a cyber attack or hacking. The other practical thing you can do, go home, do a search, use Google, use Bing, that's what we have, do a search for what's called NewsGuard. Download it into your browser. Every time you do a search, it will tell you whether the news source is a reliable source or part of Russian propaganda or something else. And then I'll leave you with the broader plea. It's something I shared with the U.S. Senator today. Remember Charles Genet. And you go, who's he? He was the French ambassador who arrived on the shores of this country in 1793. He arrived first in Charleston, South Carolina with instructions from the French government to instigate popular rebellion in the United States to move the United States government to support France in its war with England. His instructions authorized him, if needed, to try to organize the overthrow of the United States government. This was a time of huge political discord. It's worth remembering. This was a time when politicians would row boats across the Hudson so they could go to Weehawken and, and try to kill each other with pistols in armed duels. Despite that discord, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, who disagreed on almost everything, decided to unite. They put their differences aside, they supported George Washington, and they demanded the recall of Ambassador Genet. And three years later, when George Washington wrote the first farewell address as a president, something that no president would do again until Dwight Eisenhower retired in 1961, he wrote a letter to the American people. And it wasn't just the people of his day, it was the people of our day. And in that letter, he said that one of the things that he and the young country had learned from its experience was that a democratic republic, by its very nature, is susceptible to these risks of these kinds of attacks. And he said that we can disagree on everything else, but let's find a way to put our disagreements aside, really to do what Ambassador Rice suggested, so that we can unite and do what it takes to protect our democracy from these kinds of attacks. So go out and buy the book, get two-factor authorization, and join me in thanking Brad Smith for his insights today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to conclude our uh, discussion of this uh, extraordinary topic with an all-star panel. Um, uh, we're going to try to range through some of the issues that Ambassador Rice and Brad Smith have, have discussed. Um, you have their uh, biographies, so I'm not going to go through them. I want to start with General Al Alexander, who, as Susan said, was the first uh, U.S. Cyber Command commander. And I want to ask you, Keith, to just explain to this audience what the world looks like to the person who is heading Cyber Command. Uh, I said in introducing our conversation tonight that we are now in what seems to me to be a, a state of constant low-level cyber conflict. Um, and I want to just ask, uh, from the perspective, the, the position that you, you held, uh, what is, is the, the sensible response for us as a country, as a military, uh, in dealing with this conflict that just doesn't go away, seems to get worse and worse? Well, thanks, David. Uh, Ambassador Rice, thanks for those uh, nice comments and that, uh, those kind words, and Brad, for what you did. I'm going to follow on with that because when I was appointed as the first commander of U.S. Cyber Command, one of the responsibilities that we had was to defend our nation in cyber. And a lot of people looked at it and said, well, is that the government's role? 
But when you look at our Constitution, the first thing you see in the preamble, it's for the common defense. It doesn't say unless it's cyber. It doesn't say unless it's hard or we don't understand it. It's for the common defense. So to take off on what the ambassador and Brad said, the first thing that dawned on me is we can't see attacks on the country. Our country is attacked all the time by other nations, the theft of intellectual property, attacking our infrastructure, attacking our elections, creating fake news, and I think that was a, a good hit on the fake news as well, and we can't see it. Imagine trying to defend our nation from aerial attacks when you can't see airplanes that are coming at you. We would quickly address that. But our, our commercial sector can't see what's hitting other companies in the sector, nor can the government see them. So we have two sets of problems that I think have to be addressed to really talk about this persistent engagement. The first one is absent that ability, how do you take on those that are attacking you and keep pushing back while hopefully the commercial sector creates the infrastructure for a collective common defense. And it's not just for our country, it's for our allies. I think what you brought out, Brad, on the countries that would be in that group, if they work together to protect our democracies, if they work together to visualize those attacks, we could knock those down, technically. It was interesting, Secretary, I was blessed with working with both Secretary Gates and Secretary Panetta, and President Obama and President Bush and a number of others. We had a great sense of humor at times, not often enough. And they asked about what was our concern? What's your concern in this area? What do you do? And, and for Secretary Panetta, my comment was, if we can't see the attacks, we can't defend the country. We need to set that as our first objective. So it's interesting, you would think as a commander of Cyber Command and a military officer that I would think about the offense first. But the practical reality is, technically speaking, and when you look at our economy, our economy is built on technology that the adversaries can attack. It's built on critical infrastructure, our hospitals, everything that we think about, what's made us great, depends on this technology, we have to defend it. So I think what President Obama did in standing up the US Cyber Command was to create a force to start that process. Well, let's start the defense and come up with a way of protecting our country and our allies. You know, I, I got to sit in a lot of meetings uh, in the Situation Room, and sometimes I contributed, but what I always saw was no matter whether it was a Republican administration or a Democratic ad administration, they were doing what was good for our country. They were taking on these hard problems, and they agonized over how we do the right thing in cyber. My belief is it was an honor and privilege to participate in that, knowing whether it was terrorism or cyber related, that the leaders of our country were looking at each of these problems and determining what the right action was. Getting counsel from all the experience, listening to everybody, and talking about what we should do and the consequences of doing that. It was amazing. It's one of the things that the American people should see. And perhaps in your book, as you bring that out, Ambassador, you can talk about the fact that the president, my experience in one of those debates, he asked every person for their opinion, listened to them, and then brought up his, his and explained why he believed that. It was amazing. Our form of government is truly amazing. We are blessed. But there's nothing that says this will last forever. 
And so how do we defend? Well, the first thing that we have to do, I believe, if you can't see what's hitting, you have to push back on those that are throwing cyber spears at us. That's first. I'm not sure what they're doing in their persistent engagement, so I can talk and wax eloquently on this, but pushing back is the first thing I would do. Ensure those that would attack us know that we can stop it and engage them. I think they, they talked about the 2018 elections and they did that. And I think it's important for our country and our allies to know that we will do that. I would take that a step further and offer that support to them as well, collective defense. So that's where I think persistent engagement is. I think that this is hugely important to our nation and we've got to create that collective defense capability. So I want to turn to uh, Laura uh, Rosenberger, and I should just uh, say, because this is a great big room, hold your microphones close to, you, to your mouth so uh, we will uh, reach all the way to the rafters. So Laura, maybe you could just uh, talk a little bit to this audience about what you've done with the Alliance for Securing Democracies and what you've discovered. If you don't know this group's work, I think Laura and her colleagues have given the clearest public information about Russian meddling and manipulation of our political space uh, that's available uh, anywhere. So Laura, tell us a little bit about what, what you see through this work and then just say a few words about why it's so difficult to deal with information operations, operations in this space in a democracy. Well, thanks, David, for both those kind words and for the invitation to join tonight. It's such a privilege to be here with you, with your family, uh, with Ambassador Rice, um, with, with so many former colleagues and, and thinkers on this issue set. Um, so it's it's really a great privilege for me. So the Alliance for Securing Democracy was uh, sort of born about two and a half years ago um, in, in a sense to try to figure out how do we better understand the kinds of attacks that are being thrown at our democracy. My experience both in government and out was that in many ways the issues that we are dealing with today don't fit neatly into traditional bureaucratic silos. That sometimes when it comes to dealing with modern threats, threats that we're talking about here, cyber, cyber attacks, information operations, that we need new and cross-cutting ways of understanding the challenges, both from an analytic perspective and then developing policy responses that allow us to cut across, see the whole picture, and use all levels of American power to respond effectively. So we've brought together a team of folks looking at all of these challenges from different perspectives. And just a couple of takeaways that I would point out in the context of this conversation tonight, building off of some of the really important remarks that, that others have already made on this topic. The first is that when it comes to information operations or disinformation is how we mostly talk about it. I think it's really important to understand, as Ambassador Rice alluded, these operations are ongoing. We often think about this as being about elections, and it's not. Our research very much shows that while elections are, to quote one of my colleagues, a flashpoint, they are not the starting point or the end point. This is much more about attacking the very foundations of our democratic institutions, our faith in information, our faith in the ability to have a truth. The truth even exists, right? It's about picking issues to polarize Americans and pit us against each other, but it's also about creating the idea that, for instance, if you look at the, the Salisbury attack, um, the, the use of, of chemical weapons um, by the Russian government on British soil, they launched a very sophisticated information operation around that attack to basically say, not that there was some alternative version of what had happened, but that there were so many alternative versions of what had happened that there was no way of possibly knowing what had really happened. And so I think that's really one of the most important pieces from our research is to just underscore this idea that this is, as you said, a low-level persistent conflict and that 
is not just the cyber attacks on networks, that is the cyber-enabled information operations that are targeting citizens in democracies on a daily basis. I think the second point I would just note is that these tools are proliferating just as cyber tools um, more broadly are, are being used by an increasing number of actors of a variety of sophistication, information operations are coming from a, a, a growing number of particularly authoritarian regimes, um, but not always. And we are seeing them take many different forms, and I think it's really important that we understand how these tools are proliferating to other actors. And then to your, your related question of, of the challenges for democracies, I would just briefly say that I think if we go back to the point about the goal being degrading the information space, really undermining that idea of truth, democracies rest on the idea that citizens empowered with information can make decisions and choices about their futures whether it's policy questions, whether it's questions in our society, whether it's questions about what leaders to elect, that citizens armed with information can and should be able to make those decisions. And so if degrading the information is a way of weakening us, how do we as a democracy respond in a way that doesn't engage in further degradation of the very space that we seek to protect? So we can come back to that later in the conversation perhaps, but I think that that for me is one of the most important quandaries to think about. How can we always ensure that as we are responding, it is in a way that actually affirms the integrity of the information space rather than further degrade it? Just to, to underline what uh, Laura just said, uh, I happened to have had a conversation today with the head of cybersecurity for one of the leading social media companies who said what our advertiser, adversaries are trying to do is weaponize uncertainty so that you literally don't know what's true. You don't know who to believe. You don't know who to read or who to trust. So I'm very much in line with, with what Laura was saying. So Joe Nye, uh, as I think many people in this audience know, is the leading theorist of power. Joe Nye is the person who coined the term soft power. Uh, Joe Nye is the person who also coined the term s smart power. Uh, and Joe uh, was one of the earliest people to systematically write about cyber power. So I want to ask uh, Joe if he would uh, talk about um, the basics, as he's written, uh, in, in dealing with this cyber threat. Joe has written the, the, th the three basics are resilience of our systems, deterrence, and diplomacy. And ask you, Joe, to maybe to focus especially on diplomacy, uh, following what Brad said about the Digital G Geneva Convention and other efforts like it. Thanks, David. And let me start by paying tribute to Paul Ignatius. Um, it's just wonderful to see him here tonight. But to answer your question, uh, I think the thing we need to grasp as we try to understand what's going on in the cyber domain is how very new it is and how little we know, how little experience we have. Uh, in 1996, in the middle of Bill Clinton's presidency, there are only 36 million people connected to the internet. Today, there are four billion. What happens is at the end of the, of the 90s, or basically around 2000, with the World Wide Web, cyber takes off. It, there are suddenly connections which create enormous interdependence, which has huge benefits, which we all know. But with that interdependence comes vulnerability, which becomes insecurity. And if you ask how we understand this, the answer is not very well. It's still very, very new. Uh, and if you think this current situation is bad, going from 36 million to uh, something like uh, 4 billion in a uh, quarter century, uh, let me point out that most people predict with the Internet of Things, which is now beginning and which will expand rapidly, it's likely there'll be 30 billion connections to the internet by 2030. 
some people say, by 2025. So we ain't seen nothing yet, and we are on an extraordinary exponential curve. Now, if that's the role of technology, uh, then think of what's the role of laws and agreements. And uh, you'll notice that if you ask yourself, how long does it take Congress to pass a law? How long does it take states to negotiate treaties? It's much, much slower than the shape of that curve that I just described in technology. So how are we doing? And let me focus primarily on the diplomacy. We can come back to Brad covered resilience and, uh, and Laura has as well. But let me focus primarily on the diplomacy. One of the questions that was on the original pamphlet for tonight is do the laws of war apply to cyberspace? What's interesting is that there have been, been groups such as the Tallinn Group of International Lawyers, which have made a pretty good case that yes, the laws of war do apply to cyberspace. And most governments, the French government just came out with a statement earlier this week, said yes, the laws of armed conflict apply to cyberspace. Trouble with that is it's not in the area of the laws of armed conflict that we see the big problems. We talk a lot about cyber Pearl Harbor. It's the gray zone below that where we see the threats that Laura was talking about, or Keith as well. And there, it's not clear that these laws apply or not. In, the, in terms of uh, looking back for an historical analogy, uh, nuclear weapons obviously are a hugely disruptive technology in 1945. It took the nations about uh, two decades before you had your first arms control agreement, the limited test ban treaty, which was really an environmental agreement. It was three decades before we had this SALT agreements with the Soviet Union. Uh, so two decades, three decades, where are we in cyber? Well, if my technology chronology is correct, we're about two decades in the technology. And uh, we're just approaching that point was analogous to the first agreements in nuclear uh, by that same technological plotting that curve against the legal and treaty curve of diplomacy that you mentioned. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, in 1999, the, the Russians say, let's have a treaty. The Americans say, you can't have a treaty because it's totally non-verifiable. Uh, what you might call a cyber weapon, I might call a piece of code which is positive or has a good intent. In other words, if, the, if unlike a missile or a bomb, which you can analyze and inspect and verify, some cyber code, whether it's a weapon or not a weapon, depends entirely on the intention by, of the person who's using it. You can't, you can't analyze it and say, this is clearly a weapon, that's not. So you can't have the type of treaty that the Russians and the Chinese are looking for, and they're coming back at this year after year at the UN. But what we did is get the Russians and the Chinese agree to set up a UN group of government experts, which after a decade or more of working, came up in 2015 with a pretty good list of 11 norms. These are voluntary norms about how you could limit cyber conflict. Uh, that's become a little bit unstuck. The Chinese are beginning to walk back from it. The Russians have not applied it. Um, but what's interesting is you have the core, the kernel of a framework there. And it's been reinforced by things like the Paris call that Brad mentioned a, a year ago, which is going to be repeated it next uh, in November of this year. You also have private bodies. Uh, Microsoft is setting up a new cyber Peace Institute, uh, a tribute to Microsoft taking the lead in statesmanship here. So they're private initiatives. I'm a member of something called the Global Commission for Stability in Cyberspace, which was in initiated by the Dutch government, uh, which has come up with eight basic norms of how you can create stability in cyberspace, and there are many others as well. The point is that there is beginning to develop some idea of what would norms look like to govern this gray zone 
below the area where the laws of war apply. But we're a far cry from getting full agreement on that. And right now, in the UN diplomacy, the Russians and the Chinese are still going for big, grand treaties. And you have a new working group that they call the open-ended working group, which is not a good sign, which will be working alongside this group of government experts. And so what you find is there is some progress but there's still also a lot of uh, thrashing around as we try to wrap our minds around this of what's happening and see if we can develop some normative principles which could be places to anchor the diplomacy that's necessary. So, uh, I don't know, you want to call that glass half empty, glass half full? Why don't I say glass one-eighth full? How's that? That's That's... Better, better than nothing. Um, so let me ask uh, Keith to continue this uh, thread. Um, military uh, leaders often have been skeptical uh, that um, uh, an arms control diplomatic approach to cyber will work for the reason that Joe mentioned, that you can't verify compliance with it, but also um, American officials will say, privately because it would hurt us more than it would than it would help us that we're pretty powerful in this area and we'll end up constraining ourselves but leaving others uh, free to keep uh, attacking so i want to ask whether you share that skepticism or whether you think there is a way to come up with uh, norms some kind of some version of a geneva convention that at least protects civilians of course i would agree with professor nye you got a good Cause, grade cause, Yeah, because I want to I make sure if I take any courses, I graduate. I am somewhat skeptical about our ability to actually enforce that. I think as you look at this, it's interesting to go back in history and look at what we faced as a nation and, you know, what your father faced in World War II, what our country, the greatest generation, uh, what you did. And if we were to go back and look at the lessons we learned in those times, what they brought forward to us, it was first, we should have fixed the defense. It's the same lesson we learned again in 9-11. So I think as we talk about this issue of how do we set up norms and how do we treat other countries, we ought to concurrently fix our defense. We have the most to lose in this space and I believe we'll be attacked. And we haven't fixed the defense. So step one, fix the defense. I think we should try to set norms and work with our allies on this. We shouldn't give it up. I do think we should try. We should be skeptical that they will abide by those treaties because many will say they will never know it was me. But I agree with Brad that we're getting much better at knowing exactly who did it and how they did it. But they can plant the seeds of, well, it really wasn't us. So in this space, very hard to do. If we were to look back, though, and you think about the impact on our nation, we're talking about attacks of a moment. I think what Ambassador Rice hit is we're being stolen blind in our intellectual property. That's our future. That is far more impactful than some of these attacks that are going on independent. So that continuous theft of our knowledge, and now in this race for AI, losing that data and losing that will hurt the future economy of this country. Fix the defense. We can fix a collective defense and we ought to do it. It requires the cloud providers, the telecoms, critical infrastructure, and cyber companies to work together with our nation and others to do that. I think we ought to do that on a parallel course with trying to set norms. Secretary Gates asked me if we were talking about uh, offense and defense in cyber. And I told them that I would gladly give up the offense if we could ensure the defense. 
It's that important to this nation. And he agreed. And I think everybody agrees with that. Think about that. We would gladly give up offensive capabilities in cyber if we could ensure our defense. We can't ensure our defense. So I think we now have to push forward. I think it is the right thing to do. I think it's what the greatest generation taught us we should do. Push forward, but like uh, Harrison Ford, keep one eye open as we go forward. Laura, I want to ask you to return to the, the question that, that I mentioned earlier of weaponizing un uncertainty and that being a part of what's so scary when we think about threats to the information space. And I'll be honest, although I'm a member of the, the news business, I sometimes worry that all of the attention we give to Russian meddling, to the way our uh, information space is being undermined, only adds to the worries people have about whether they can trust anything. So could you talk a little bit about that problem uh, of, of uncertainty and ways in which we could think about putting more trust back into this information space? Yeah, I think it's a really important question and something that I think we really need to strike the right balance on. So a couple of points on this. One, looking at lessons both from the Cold War and dealing with Soviet active measures, as well as looking at how some of our European allies who are on the front lines of dealing with Russia's ongoing operations, targeting them, we see that building public awareness, building resiliency through raising awareness about these tactics is one of the components of helping to reduce the effectiveness of these operations. But that also needs to be accompanied by a sense that action is being taken to shore up the institutions. So to give an example, one of my biggest concerns about an election scenario is essentially what Brad alluded to about you know, some kind of questions about were votes counted or not, and that there was some evidence of a probe on parts of the election system. But that's actually accompanied by a large-scale information operation to basically say the vote was rigged, right? So it may actually not be the case that anything was actually changed or not counted or counted wrong, but the perception is created through a sophisticated information operation combined with some small-scale cyber probing or attack that basically induces doubt in the minds of the citizenry about the outcome of the election itself. And the only way to address that concern is by giving people the confidence that we have done everything possible to ensure that our voting systems are secure. Because if we can point to measures that ensure the integrity of those systems, we can then easily push to the side those disinformation operations aimed at undermining the trust. It's why the kinds of things Ambassador Rice was talking about that have been stalled um, in the halls of Congress are really critical to get through, not just because of threats to the integrity of the election systems themselves, but to the idea that people could doubt them. We need to restore people's faith in the institutions, and I think it's that combination of raising awareness to build resiliency with assurance that steps are being taken to ensure the integrity of our institutions that is what will ultimately help build our resilience. Joe, I want to ask you to also address this question of how we put more trust uh, into the information space. And let me add one additional uh, point uh, of the sort that we might raise if we were at the, at the Harvard Kennedy School. To me, the paradox of the internet, this technology that we thought was going to be 
liberating uh, in ways that the world had never seen, making information available to everyone. The paradox of that technology is that it's ended up empowering the governments that control information, and it's ended up enfeebling governments that let information flow freely. So I want to ask you whether you, you share that concern about, about that paradox, and then more fundamentally, how do we put trust back into the system? Well, I, I uh, think there is not a single answer, a simple answer, but let me take the issue that Laura has done such a great job working on of uh, uh, the interference of foreigners in our electoral process. What's fascinating is, uh, to go back historically, there was a cyber utopianism. Everything was going to be great in the 90s. And then that was followed by a cyber triumphalism. The big social media companies were ours. These giants astride the globe were ours. And the Russians in 2016 learned how to turn those American companies into weapons against the American election process. Facebook didn't do this on purpose. They just wanted an algorithm that would sell ads. But the Russians learned how to manipulate that algorithm so they could disrupt our electoral process. Uh, so all of a sudden, things where we thought the flows were in our direction, as you said, turned the other way. Now, what can you do about it? Well, go back to what you asked earlier about resilience, deterrence, and diplomacy. Resilience means doing the types of things that Laura and Keith and Brad were talking about. We've got to get more money helping state and local government. We've got to get paper ballots. Microsoft has an interesting new technology. You can check whether your vote was counted properly. But we also have to get cyber hygiene. We have to get people to do the kinds of things of two-factor authentication. If you are an intern, you've just joined a political campaign, and a phishing email comes in, you're probably going to fall for it. You've got to really drill down and get the whole organization to realize the types of things that Brad was talking about. So resilience is first. Second is deterrence. I would tell the Russians that basically, and according to the press accounts, I won't ask Keith to verify this, but according to press accounts, uh, uh, Cyber Command was able to interfere with some of the attacks done by the St. Petersburg group, which were going to interfere in the 2018 congressional elections. Good on them. I would go a step further on deterrence. I would say to the Russians, knock it off. And if you don't knock it off, next time somebody in the Putin family goes to check his Swiss bank account or one of his favorite oligarchs tries to withdraw some money, it's going to be empty. And when you say, that's outrageous, you can't do it. And you said, we told you it was outrageous to interfere with our elections. Now, either we can come to a rules of the road on this, or you're going to see more empty bank accounts. So I would take a few other steps of that sort. And that then leads to the third thing that would go with this. I happen to agree with this idea of persistent engagement, but it should be coupled with more communication and diplomacy. We should say to the Russians, here are red lines on interfering in our electoral process. If you cross those red lines, you're going to have more painful encounters like this. But we're willing to negotiate or to arrange a rules of the road with you of where you go and where you don't go. Now you say, how can you possibly do that when they're authoritarians and we're Democrats, there's no common ground? Well, in 1972, when we had much greater ideological differences with the Soviet Union than we have with Russia today, we negotiated something called an incidents at sea agreement by which we agreed to limit the close surveillance that ships and aircraft do against each other at sea. Not because we liked each other or because we had common values, because both of us realized that if we didn't set rules of the road, the escalation would be worse for both of us. 
And I think we could do something analogous to that with the Russians today, saying, okay, here's our declaration of what's intolerable or not, and we'll accept you making a similar declaration, and if we find a concern that you violated that, here's a communications process by which we'll get at it. But if you don't, then you're gonna see more of those empty bank accounts. So that's an example applied to the election issue of resilience, deterrence, and diplomacy. So, uh, among other things, I think you have the plot of a great spy novel, and yes. somebody's going to steal Somebody it. Ought to write it. Somebody should. <laughs> so, I want to ask each of you to, to engage uh, one more uh, deeply worrying problem. We, we've all uh, thought about the problem of fake news. Uh, stories that uh, are concocted uh, in St. Petersburg and spun. But we're now looking at the prospect of, of fake events, of imagery and sound that was manufactured. The technology to do that exists today. You could have a version of any of us here saying things that would have devastating effect uh, and using modern uh, uh, adversarial networks, machine learning, uh, it, would, it, would, it, would be, it would appear to be real. So, Keith, let me ask you uh, to start this off by speaking to one of my nightmares, which is how does Cyber Command, NSA, the government in general, make sure that the information that goes to decision makers as they're assessing what to do is real. That that imagery that you have, uh, 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 the sound that, you, that you're picking up is, 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 is real and not manufactured with deliberate in uh, uh, intent to deceive. So I, I think that's easier to do with our intelligence community than it is in the media and the press that goes to our people. Because we would use sources and methods, whether it's signals intelligence, imagery intelligence, human intelligence, multiple sources to cross-reference what we're seeing is that exactly right. And I believe we do a good job on that. But you raise a great point. And if you look at what happened in the Ukraine election, the Russians created a story for the ethnic Russians that ethnic Ukrainians had bayoneted a three-year-old child and left his body on the front lawn of their parents, of the parents. Absolutely fake. But it spun people up. It got them going. And those are the kinds of issues that we face in the country and so I think that's part of where government and commercial industry really have to work together. I think part of it was what Brad brought out. How do you know that this is the right news? Is there a way to actually look at that in the future? How can we prove that? And how do we work towards defending that network as a whole? I think we've got to do all of this. It's one of the greatest concerns I have is not just the meddling with the elections, but the the statement that so-and-so did something when it's completely fake and they lose the election because of fake news or something somebody has spun. So, Laura, talk about the, um, uh, the, the commercial, the, the social media side of this. Um, Keith has said that the government will do a pretty good job of making sure that imagery is, is accurate, but for social media companies, uh, that's uh, uh, an enormous challenge. Something, you know, take the video of Nancy Pelosi slowed down so she appeared to be slurring her words. That got spun, but be became viral. Um, one real problem for the social media companies is that they're not sure they want to be in the business of telling you what's true. And second, the users of social media may well resent being told uh, this is true and this is false. And to be honest, I'm not sure I want somebody telling me what they think is, is true and false. So 
Talk about uh, how we're going to deal with this, not in the government space, but in, in the private and social media space. Yeah, I think it's a complicated set of questions that are really important to work through, again, from the sort of values frame as a democracy. How do we work to a more trustworthy information space is the goal, um, with the continued emphasis on free and open exchange of ideas that is so core to who we are as a, as a nation, our very first amendment. A couple of thoughts on this. First, I think one thing that's important to, to underscore um, is that actually most of the information manipulation that we have seen by Russian actors, by others in this space, actually is not about information of whether the content is true or not. It's usually actually much more commonly about actors who are pretending to be someone other than they say they are or who are engaging in some kind of comp what, what's often called computational propaganda, algorithmically manipulated content so that it games the system, right, as you were talking about earlier. So I think there is the question of true or false content and what to do with that or otherwise manipulated content, but I think it's important just to sort of put that in perspective of the, of the overall kinds of activity that we see. But on this question of true or not and how the social media companies should handle this, I, I do think it's a really important question. One piece, I think, is that you know, NewsGuard that, that Brad talks about is basically about providing consumers of information with context about the information that they are seeing. It's not actually saying we decide this is this, this thing or the other thing. In fact, Facebook for a while was, was flagging and still in some instances does have a, have a fact checking system where content is flagged as disputed content and studies of that particular flagging mechanism have actually shown people are more likely to click on something that is labeled disputed because they are curious about why. So I think it's really important, number one, that we sort of understand the psychology behind some of this, which Joe and I were talking about earlier. I think that the second piece of it is that, yes, um, I think that we can all agree that having large companies who are ultimately accountable to shareholders and not to citizens uh, make decisions about things that impinge on freedom of speech, potentially, really getting at the core of our political conversations is maybe not the right course of action. But I also think it's important to understand that for, for most of these platforms that we're talking about, the information is in some ways being served up to people by an algorithmically driven system. It's not neutral pipes with information flowing across simply as it comes across the transom. There's far too much information for that to be possible. And so there are ways to address the underlying systemic pipes and how they actually present information to ensure that it is actually not promoting the manipulated content, but that it is actually in some ways giving people a, a variety of information that actually prioritizes quality. The, the last point I would just make is on the question you were getting at with General Alexander around manipulated audio and video content, synthetic media often called deep fakes in the video content space. There is some really great work being done by the private sector on this. Microsoft is leading a lot of it. Others are, are working on this. I actually am less concerned in some ways about that challenge in the sense that I think there's a it, it's a threat that's been recognized early. It's one that a lot of investment is going into. It's a really tough challenge. I think that the, the threat is actually very much to this question of if we no longer believe what we see, what does that mean for truth at all? But I think it's really commendable how much effort is going into addressing this problem on the front end. And I think there's a range of other sort of emerging challenges in the tech space where I hope to see that same kind of identification of potential threats early and real resources being directed to help address it on the front end. So, Joe, on this question of what's real, what's, what's true, uh, if, if you're a, a, an art collector and you want to buy a painting, uh, you know, let's say you want to buy an old master's uh, expensive painting, you want to make sure that it's not a fake. There are a lot of art forgers around, so you do what, what they, art business calls 
provenance. You establish the provenance of that painting. You, you, you see exactly, you know, who sold it to whom. You establish the whole chain that brings it to you. So let me ask you whether you think it's possible to have provenance of facts that we see uh, on social media in this information space, or what other ways you think we might deal with this problem? Well, I should point out that the recent issue of The Economist of London, uh, which talked about the Internet of Things and the fact that it's going to be harder and harder to know what's real, and the attack surface is growing enormously. So the problem is there. There are some technological improvements. Artificial intelligence makes a lot of this more difficult, but artificial intelligence works on both the offense and the defense side. I think that's what Laura was referring to. So the cat and mouse game is going to continue. Um, I think more important than the detailed technological cat and mouse game that's going to happen is the realization that you can't do this alone. You joked that I needed to write a spy novel. Uh, I haven't, but I do have a book coming out at the end of the year called Do Morals Matter? And it looks at presidents in foreign policy over the last 70 years. And the one thing that's common to American power to deal with issues for that 70-year period is the fact that we leveraged institutions and our relations with allies. And the 46th president, whenever or however he or she is elected, is going to have to deal with some big issues, the rise of China, climate change, and how to deal with this fourth generation of information technology. And the first step of wisdom on that is going to realize you can't do it alone. And that means that we're going to have to pursue these diplomatic initiatives. Getting a common diplomacy with Russia and China is not going to be easy, but you can think of concentric circles where we work with a group of like-minded states to deal with how we regulate or normalize things in certain areas. And there are some areas where we can do deals, even if they're bilateral, with the Russians, like the one I mentioned analogizing incidents at sea. So you can't go it alone. And this idea that somehow we'll just do it ourselves and technology will give us the fix is a false approach. And the lesson of our 75 years since 1945 has been the great power of the United States has been the ability to leverage others, both as allies and through institutions. And so as we approach any particular aspect of this problem, deep fakes or others, it's got to be in that broader context. So we've come to the uh, end of our, of our time, and we want to let you go home to your homes and, and families. Uh, I want to just thank all of the speakers, um, Susan Rice, uh, Brad Smith, and my three panelists. Uh, for being so generous. I want to thank the Cathedral for hosting this discussion. It's quite extraordinary to uh, talk about public affairs in this magnificent building. You can't help but uh, look up uh, at the, the ceiling uh, every now and then and think how extraordinary it is. If, if there's one point that was made by every speaker tonight, it was the essential requirement to work together. Uh, both as a country and with our key allies. And I'll just close uh, with, th with that note and, again, thanking all of our speakers and all of you for coming tonight.